Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Synotonic. Today's story is out of Maria Martin. It's an oldie, but a wool. A wool wool. Let's go. I've got a hair stuck in my glasses. It is warm here today. Warum, warum. I've got a touch of the hay fever. Oh, and I've been bitten. I've been bitten. It's a real nasty bite. I won't scare you with it. But I felt it and I was like, ow. I didn't see what cretin it was, but it's really sore and my arm is like pink around it. And I haven't had a bite like that for a long time. But yeah, so that's stinging. And I've got a touch of the hay fever. So excuse me if my voice is a little bit croaky and whatnot. I, it affects my throat and my eyes. My eyes are really itchy and it's just a hot mess. Anyhow, today's case takes place in 1801. In Suffolk, England, Maria was born into a fairly poor family and her father, I've never heard of this before, but his job was he was a mole catcher. Back in the day, you would have a mole catcher. He would catch the moles, kill the moles, skin the moles and then use their hides to make gloves. Fancy that. Maria was intelligent. She was very pretty. Her mother sadly died and then her father, Thomas, he remarried some, to, to somebody who was only a couple of years older than Maria herself. And mm, there's not much said about that, but we'll come back round to it because it is crucial in the story. It's a very old case, so some of the things I put my own judgment onto and then I thought, oh, it was 18... Well, she was born in 1801, but, you know, it, it was a long, long time ago. So, however... It's, it would seem that Maria was promiscuous. So in her early 20s, she met a man named Thomas Corder and they struck up a relationship. He was the son of a wealthy landowner. Maria fell pregnant and Thomas was out of there. Now, I'm going to just imagine that contraception was not a thing in the in 1801. Or she was born in 1801, but you know what I mean, back then. If, if there was any attempt at that, it would have been incredibly crude and probably not effective. She falls pregnant. Thomas is bye-bye, see ya. Doesn't want anything to do with that. She was just a fun time. Before Maria even had this baby, she has got a new man, Peter Matthews. And he stuck around because, so she had, she had Corder's baby. Bear, bear with me, there are a lot of names in this case. And there's a lot of ways that people sort of connect to each other. Anyhow, she has the baby, Corda's baby. That baby sadly dies. And then she falls pregnant with Matthew's baby. And then the subject of being married and things like that comes into play because I, I don't even get this, but Matthew was, Matthew was still around when she gave birth to another man's baby. And he stayed. And then she got pregnant with his baby. And then he decided that, well, that wasn't going to be okay because they were having a baby out of wedlock. So off he went. Okay, this must have been quite a common occurrence because of the whole no, no contraception or, you know, lack of. I'm going to have to Google it. Wish I hadn't looked. I'll share my, my findings. So in the UK, because this is where our story was based, there was a variety of contraceptives. <laughs> the first one is condoms made from animal intestines such as sheep calf or goat held in place with a ribbon <sighs> uh, okay oh this one is sounds just wrong uh, sponges used with liquids thought to have spermicidal properties such as olive oil okay wow the sponges were held in cotton netting to make them easier to remove mm, makes sense i mean we we're clever aren't we then there were suppositories and pessaries for the lady, which physically would block the cervix. Oh, and then syringes that were sold with acidic solutions to, you know, oh, uh -huh. wow. Oh, gosh. This is just absolutely gross. So there was uh, spermicides that they tried to make from honey, salt and crocodile dung sponges that were made of moss grass or bamboo it all just sounds very uncomfortable doesn't it and a lot of these methods were ineffective and some of them actually quite dangerous so I'm just going to assume that 
people just had at it and whatever happened happened most of the time because yeah uh, who's who wants to that does not make for fun times does it i should wrap this up in a animal's intestine with and tie it up with a ribbon yeah also i read that there was actually the whole sort of religious and moral aspect of even using contraception anyway so even though these methods did exist there were it, it, it wasn't people were there were lots of people that were like you know that's against god's will and stuff like that to to even use or even think about it so because she gets pregnant quite a lot spoiler alert so matthew now he, again he's oh you're having my baby okay bye he's off my apologies matthews i keep saying matthew matthews he was peter matthews matthews and none of these men want to have a baby outside of wedlock either, because that is scandalous, absolutely scandalous. So Matthews, he decided that he was happy to send money and support the child, but he would not marry Maria, and he wanted absolutely nothing to do with the child. Maria has the baby, and this baby does survive. And it's at this time that she then meets, do you remember Thomas Corder? She meets his brother, William right? This is what I mean where people are connected. So she she starts hanging around with William, basically, Thomas's brother. William was a naughty one. He was a criminal. And his father, he was, he was disgraced by his family. Is that the, the words? He stole some livestock. So his father, Tom and Thomas's father, he was a wealthy landowner and had a farm and had livestock and all of this. So rich and naughty. William, he had stolen some of his, his father's livestock and sold it like for himself. Just very, you know, that's mischievous, isn't it? Well, that's naughty, criminal, rude, all the bad words. His family, his father was then like in utter disbelief and he didn't know what to do with him. So he sent his son William off, sent him away, gave him an, a certain amount of money and said, you need to go off into the world and make a life for yourself. I want to see what you can do. Here's some money you need to go because you, I'm, I'm just, you're an utter disgrace. I want you to prove to me that you could make, make something of yourself. Here's a little bit of money. Probably quite a bit of money, you know, to start, start something for yourself. Well, that didn't work very well because William just went off and squandered his money, just spent it, lavished himself. And he did not make something of himself. He reverted to crime. So once he'd gone through his father's money, he then just became a criminal. He'd been sent to London, that's it, so London, to make something of himself. But then his father and his brother became very unwell. So he had to go back to the farm to help his mother run the business. And sadly, his father passed away. He died from tuberculosis. And then Thomas, the first brother that we heard about, he passed away. He died tragically. He fell through some ice into freezing water and he he died. And then not long after that, and the other brother, I, I don't know his name, but he also died tragically very young. This left William as the only remaining man in the family. And he then inherited the land, the farm and everything like that. So he became the owner of this fortune, wealth, farm, land. Crazy. William and Maria had to keep their relationship, their love affair, a secret, mainly because Maria's parents were not impressed about it at all. They didn't like the idea of this William. First of all, he's a bad boy. And second of all, he has his brother abandoned Maria when she was pregnant. So they're not they're not all that keen on William. So the pair of them met up in secret and had this secret love affair. And then guess what? Shortly after this, Maria falls pregnant. This is with William's baby. And everything seems nice at now because William, unlike the other two men in Maria's life, William has said, do you know what? I am actually going to marry you. I'm going to marry you. I love you. I'm going to do the right thing. We're going to have this baby. We will get married. Let's go. And despite Maria's parents really not liking William, they had to put that aside because Maria and her family were really poor. She's already got a child. And this wealthy, now wealthy landowner has said that he will marry Maria. So that is a big, that's a big deal, big deal back in the day. So they don't like him, but this is going to be 
all okay. Also, for another man, I imagine back in the day, back in the day, how many times am I going to say that? I imagine back then that it was a big deal to, to marry somebody that already had a child with another man. And it was, she was really judged and looked down upon because she has now, Maria, had three I still think people get quite a lot of judgment about things like that now. Not that I'm judgmental of it, but, you know, each to their own. But I think, yeah. But anyway, she'd had three, effectively, even though only one child at this point has survived, she's had three babies with three different men. And certainly back then that was really frowned upon. It then felt all a bit, uh, what's that word? You know, when hypocritical, is that the right, is that what I mean? I'm not sure. Because William sent her away to have the baby because he didn't want any prying eyes. So I'm going to imagine, were they going to keep this baby a secret and then get married? I don't really know. So he sent her away to have her pregnancy and then to have the baby. Sadly, that baby died two weeks after it was born. What do you mean four minutes? Why aren't you charging? It, what? Turn them out. <laughs> Why are you saying three minutes? Why aren't you charging? I'm terrified now. All I can do is wait and see what goes on here. Because that wouldn't be on. I'm really not sure what's going on with my camera. and I'm not happy about it because it's saying it's not charging. Things were really rocky between Maria and William at that point. It, it wasn't going very well. Some people said that they believed William had something to do with the death of the baby, but I couldn't find anything about that. And the couple just argued a lot. He insisted that he was going to marry Maria, but it seemed as if he he, he was playing, dra playing, what's that phrase? Oh, a helicopter. Maria also suspected that William was stealing the money, like once a thief, always a thief that sort of thing, although he was a very wealthy man at this point, I, I believe. But she believed that the money that Peter Matthews was sending for their child, that that was going missing and that, that her uh, William was stealing it. So it was all very messy. They, were all, they weren't happy. Brief pause there because my camera ran out of battery. I didn't know what was going on, but I've worked it out. Anyway, we're back. So... I do believe that all the while Maria and William were still meeting up in secret and quite often their meetups would be somewhere called the Red Barn and that was it was a prominent place in the town where they lived and that was their secret maybe not so secret place. I also wonder whether Maria was the only person woman that he was taking back there because another thing that came to light was that William was a womanizer so while she was off being pregnant and having a baby, I imagine that the Red Barn did get fair use. All of a sudden, at one point, things are not going well, she's not happy, they're arguing, and it would seem that William had a massive change of heart because he was stringing her along. That's what I was trying to find in my vocabulary earlier. He was string, stringing her along because the baby has been born, the baby has sadly passed away, but he's not marrying her. All of a sudden, he's he's decided that they should marry and it should be quickly. They should elope. He also tells Maria that they need to move quick because he's heard noise that Maria is going to be prosecuted for having children out of wedlock. Oh, uh. He told Maria that they needed to meet at the Red Barn and there was some delay. They were meant to meet on a Wednesday and a Thursday and they didn't. But eventually, on the 18th of May in 1827, Maria went to the Red Barn and Maria was never seen alive again. As far as she was aware, they were going to elope, they were going to marry, and this was in order to keep her safe from prosecution. Sadly, that was not the case. Maria was not seen again. And her family, at first, they believed that she had indeed gone and eloped and got married, but then didn't return. And any communication that they did have, communication... I feel like I said I didn't say that correctly. Any communication, any communication that they did have was always with William. I think that William had concocted a story that he thought was going to work very well, and then it did not. It backfired. So William returns to the farm. So he's back in the same town where the, the Maria's family live, and they're like, "All right, where's Maria?" 
You married, are you? Where's, where is she? Oh, so he tells them all that there's been an incident with the marriage certificate and she's had to remain in Ipswich, I believe. That's where they eloped to, to marry. That must be the case. And so she, she was there. She was staying in Ipswich until the marriage licence or marriage certificate was sorted because, he said, she was terrified to come home because there was a warrant for her arrest. And if she didn't have the proper documentation, I mean, it's a clever story, I suppose. If she didn't have the, the proper documentation to say that she was married to William, she risked being arrested and what have you. So the family, they did buy that at first. They were like, oh yeah, okay. Everyone sort of believed William and his story about her possibly being arrested for having, a, having children, multiple children out of wedlock. I don't know what he expected because it felt like he just got a bit, oh, they're not shutting up. They're not just leaving it alone. Of course they're not. They they want to know where their loved one is. So after a few weeks of being back, he had to leave because he was just getting questioned all the time. Like, where is she? What's going on? When is she coming back? How long is the certificate going to take? I don't know what he thought was going to happen. Did he think they were just going to go quiet and accept that she never came home? Anyway. So off he goes. He goes to London. He then goes to the Isle of Wight, a little cheeky holiday. And this is where, in all of these locations, he writes letters back to the family. Like, oh, I'm with, with Maria now and we're having a wonderful time. And mm, again, it's all a bit suspicious. Why is Maria, if you're now with Maria, why is she not writing? Where is she? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. At one point he says, oh, she has been writing. Are you not getting her letters? As if, like, oh, you're only getting my letters. But she is writing, but you're not getting them. Good one. And then he also said, oh, actually, now she's hurt her hand, so I'm writing on her behalf. OK, come on now. And then William got a bit bored and a bit tired of all of this tomfoolery. And he returned to London, where he planned to just start a new life for himself. All the while, no one knows where Maria is and what's happened to her. So he comes back to London. I'm assuming he tells nobody because he puts an ad in the in a local newspaper in London asking for a wife because that's what you could do back then. And I believe there were like applications. He was a wealthy landowner. It's a bit like, yeah, so sort of kind of like arranged marriages, but not because it yeah, so he would. He was just like, who wants to be my wife? This is me. This is about me. Do you want to marry me? And then, yeah, so he picked a wife, Mary Moore. And isn't that just a kick in the teeth? Because Maria was there all that time, like, will you marry me? Please marry me. I've had your baby. Yes, the baby died, but will you marry me? Please marry me. And never. And then he simply put an ad into a newspaper for a wife. It's just, okay. <sighs> so he marries Mary Moore. They marry in the November of 1827 and they opened a school for girls in Ealing. Now I can only assume that in this time he's just stopped writing to Maria's family so that must be have been horrible for them. They had no idea where she was but then news travels doesn't it? News travels fast and the family find out that he is in London and that he has married another woman. And this is where it gets spicy because Maria, she had a stepmother. So we're going to go full circle back to the stepmom, who's only a year older than Maria. And all of a sudden, at this point in the story, Maria's stepmother starts to have dreams. She starts to have visions about what's happened to Maria and where Maria is. Her name is Anne, by the way. I don't think I've said her name yet, Anne. So Anne starts to tell her husband about these dreams and she says to her husband, Maria's father, you need to go to the Red Barn because every dream I have is M Maria standing over her grave at the Red Barn and that is where she is. That's where her body is. So off he goes. Anne even knows or is able to direct her husband to the place she describes the place in the barn where she keeps seeing Maria's body. Oh, she keeps seeing that place in the in the red in her dreams. Right? So off he goes and he takes his fork, pitchfork thing that he would take to hunt moles. 
and he goes to this particular place in the red barn and he can see immediately that the soil has been disturbed in this place that his wife Anne has has told him about. So he starts using his pitchfork to move the earth, you know, get a spade, be easier. No, anyway, so he's doing that. And lo and behold, he finds the body of his daughter, Maria. Because of the history with William and Maria, and he was the last person to see her alive at the Red Barn, all of this business. So the police are called and they go and arrest William. He's taken into custody. He was at the schoolhouse in London, the school that he owns with his new wife, Mary. He is put into jail and he awaits trial. And the media go crazy. The newspapers, everything is, it's all over the newspaper. There's so many, I I did find lots of uh, newspaper clippings and stuff. I'll share some. And he was basically found guilty by the public. Everyone thought he was guilty long before his trial. And I mean, uh, they weren't wrong. And and, uh, yeah, you know how it is. It still happens to this day. We speculate and all the rest of it. It was a huge, huge story. Everyone had something to say, but most people believed he was guilty. And also something that struck me, and there was another case that was an old case, the Axe Murder House. How um, curious people are. I suppose that is still true. I don't know how it would be nowadays if, if we were allowed to yeah, I, I guess we're just we're this exactly the same because it probably would be the same. But hordes of people went to the Red Barn and they picked it apart. They wanted a souvenir of the place. You know, they just they wanted a piece of the case. And yeah, literally, they even made the the wood, some of the wood from the barn into toothpicks. What the deuce? What the deuce? Also, Maria's grave, that was taught, like, basically that people took all parts of her grave as well. Yeah, just, I guess, wanting a piece of history. The trial was in August, August the 7th, 1828. And William did bring up to the judge the fact that his case was so huge and that everyone thought he was guilty. And he wanted his case to be moved to a different part of the country so people didn't know, so that it would be like a fair trial and people would just hear the evidence and not the whole media circus. You know, this is what he was worried about, but the judge had none of that. The exact cause of Maria's death was not known. Now, there was a gun gunshot to her face. There was a green handkerchief tied around her neck. There were sharp injuries to her body. But that could have been from the pitchfork because her father was like, digging around the grave. So, yeah, obviously this is very old. So the tr- trying to work out forensically what had gone on was quite difficult. So it could have been strangulation. It could have, the cause of death could have also been uh, stabbings. There were marks on her body and also gunshot wounds there were some gunshot wounds through her body so they weren't sure and what they did is they they charged William with a number of different like modes of what do I mean possible ways that he murdered her stabbing shooting strangulation even being buried burying her alive just to cover all bases Maria's younger brother, George, he was 10, he said he was a witness and he said that he had seen William with a loaded pistol leading up to the disappearance of Maria and also that he'd seen William leaving the red barn with a pickaxe and that was after Maria had gone into the barn. We don't really know how he killed Maria but he, he killed Maria. In court, William said that what actually had happened is that he had left Maria in the barn and they had argued again about the situation with this stolen money, the money that she believed he was taking from her that was sent for her child. And he left her in the barn with one of his pistols. And then when he returned to the barn, he returned because he heard a shot and she had, in fact, unalived herself and he didn't know what to do, so he buried her in the barn. That that was his story. However, the jury, they went off and they deliberated for like half an hour, not long, came back and guilty, thank you, please. His sentence was death by hanging. And then his body was to be dissected 
and then used for uh, science, you know, medical, to learn things from. So he wouldn't have like a final resting place. He would be used as a guinea pig. He was only in prison for three days, so did not mess around then. So he was in prison for three days after his sentencing, and then he was executed. In prison, in those three days, he did confess to accidentally shooting her through the eye. And that was what he said. It was an accident. Mate, if she had unalived herself, or you had accidentally shot her, why on earth... You know, if there wasn't premeditation there, like, why on earth would you be going, go, like, pretending that she was alive for so long? He just pretended to her poor family that she was alive. That, to me, does not scream an accident or someone has unalived themselves. And if he had accidentally shot her through the eye, he also would have been able to probably say that she had done that to herself. And the whole thing, yeah, but he, you know, he was lying. He had killed her, I, I, I think. Like I said, people were very curious. People paid lots of money to go and watch the trial. There were so many people that couldn't go in. That, that it, Obviously, they ran out of tickets, whatever, you know, tickets to watch the show. We, and they ran out of tickets, spaces, paid spaces. And there were like hordes of people outside the courtroom just waiting. Just so, yeah, so curious. I guess now we have so much access to things online that we don't need to leave our house to, to be curious. But yeah, they were. And there were thousands of people at his execution. So he was hung. And then his body was left to ha hang there for like an hour. So people could have a look, have a gander. And then he was taken away. And then he was, there was a big cut made down the front of his body. And he was then allowed to be viewed like that. So they cut, I guess it is just curiosity. So they sliced down, down his middle, opened him up and then just let everyone look. I don't think I'd be that curious to see that, you know. No, thank you. Anyhow, people did look, thousands, again thousands. And then he was dissected. And it's thought that they tried, they had a battery of some description. They were, They were sort of testing things on his body you know for medical science and stuff like that which is what he was told would happen to him and then they used his skeleton as a you know they they removed his skeleton and he was one of those skeletons that you see the man that had hanged him took his trousers again like souvenirs and then he the, the hangman sold portions of the rope that had been used to hang William? Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that must have happened for so many, on so many occasions. William's scalp and ears were put on display in a museum in London. Then what else happened to him? Oh, the skull. His skull at one point. So his body was made, his skeleton was made into a medical prop thing. But somehow a man named Dr Kil Kilner, he was a follower of the case, you know, like a fanatic. And he ended up with the skull, right? And he kept it in a cupboard in a box downstairs. This is just weird. And there's other, there's some other really weird things. For example, apparently his skin was used to make a book, a, a book that you know about his crime. Why? It's such it is morbid curiosity, isn't it? But that's not curious. That's just oh, it's grim. Anyhow, so Dr Kilner, he had other memorabilia things from the Red Barn and all that. So he really was like a fanatic. He's got this skull, he's brought it home. And the minute it was in his possession, he started to hear voices and, yeah, like have really bad luck and all this business. And then one night he heard noise from downstairs and the skull was in a cabinet. It was in a box and he came downstairs and the cabinet was open. The box was open and the skull was on the other side of the room. What? Mm -mm. so he believed that this was the spirit of William he was very unhappy with the fact that his body had been that he didn't have a resting place this is what Dr Kilner thought so he buried the skull and gave it a proper it, it he the skull a proper resting place and then the body, the rest of William's body, was on display in a museum in London up until 2004. And then 
the descendants of the Corder family, so his his descendants, they asked for his body to be taken out of the museum and to be cremated. So it was. And I just find that fascinating. Yeah, it is, it is morbid, isn't it? Yeah. In our local museum, there's a there's a real life skeleton of a of a man. It is a bit weird. It's a bit eerie as well. It is a bit like, hmm, you were alive. Do you know what I mean? And we're all gawping at your bones. Like I said, it's an old case, so there were things that were left to rumour and things that could be wrong in what I have read and what I've looked at. So bear bear with that. But it's not hard to imagine for a moment that Anne had some knowledge of what had happened to Maria. Now, the rumours that went around were that Anne, she was only one year older than Maria, and William was a womaniser. People therefore believed that William was having an affair with Anne, Maria's stepmother, and that very possibly could have been the case. And that for some reason, I mean, I I find it hard to believe that he was that he would be that stupid, as in to tell Anne where he had buried her stepdaughter's body. But stranger things have happened. Who's to say that he hadn't fallen wildly in love with Anne? The speculation is that he was stringing Anne along as well. And he said, you know, I'll get rid of Maria and then we can run off together. But when he didn't return and he married somebody else, Mary Moore, you know, what's that saying? Nothing like a woman scorned. Well, Anne was then like all of a sudden had her visions because it was only after he married Mary that Anne started to have visions and dreams about where Maria's body was. So I reckon, don't you? I reckon that was the case. I think she thought she was going to run off with her lover and that just did not happen. All of these women that were just like falling head over heels for William, just like, marry me, run away with me, have an affair with me. All of this... And then he just puts an, I can't get over that, just puts an ad in the paper and then marries some, like one of them. Well, I just, yeah, just bizarre. I think that that is all I have on today's case. Hopefully I haven't forgotten anything. The thing that captured me with this one was just the curiosity of people and the cold disregard that this William seemed to have for people, women, and the brazen nature of it. wonder what happened to Maria's child she had a child with Peter Matthews wonder what happened there did possibly grow up in her family she had a sister called Anne funny enough so I wonder if the child ended up there let me know what you think of this one do you think he did it do you think Anne knew more than she was letting on hope you all have had a wonderful weekend no hope you've had a wonderful week hope you have a nice weekend oh we're going away for a little trip this weekend that'd be nice so at this point when this comes out, I'll probably be a bit stressing about, you know, like, have I packed everything? It's only one night, though. It's the dreaded charger situation. Like, oh, you don't want to leave a charger plugged in. In all of my time, that's only happened once. All of my years. And it actually wasn't me, it was Paul. He left his charger at a hotel. And he did get it back because it was a local-ish place. So he just drove and got it another day. Story time was safe. <sighs> Anyhow, I'm going to love you and leave you because I am going to have a nice cup of tea. I'm going to rest my bones. I'm going to enjoy a little bit of peace. It's my birthday this week. Oh, it will have just happened. It was my birthday yesterday. When you watch this, it was my birthday yesterday. So that hence, and Paul's birthday was on Monday. So that's why we normally do like a little, we have a little celebration on the weekend before or after. So that's what why we're we're going away for the night with the kids it'll be nice so it won't be like particularly restful it's not spa or anything like that we're going to go and like look at some stuff and visit some places so it'll be kind of busy but yeah I'm looking forward to it change the scenery I'm going to love you and leave you happy for a beautiful weekend thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Sintonic hope you join me next week for another true crime story a glass or a jar of gin be good bye